Welcome, everybody. My name is Jeff Macker. I'm a professor in the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. I'm also the academic director for the Center for Business and Public Policy, the entity that's actually paying for your lunch. <laughs> I was asked to do four things. I'll only take about an hour and a half in doing that. Uh, the first thing is to introduce the center. The center was founded in 2002 by this man, John May. I'll introduce him in a minute. Uh, very much focused at the nexus of business and public policy. It's a nonpartisan uh, research uh, think tank uh, where we focus on issues in, around regulation, innovation, and public policy. So we're made up of senior policy fellows, which are mainly academics, as well as senior industry and innovation fellows, which are mainly industry practitioners. Our focus uh, is it across a diverse <coughs> number of industries, including uh, internet telecom, freight rail, biopharmaceuticals, medical devices, and others. We focus on economic issues. We try to bring in industry practitioners, policymakers, and academics for dialogue and discussion on issues that are impacting uh, the economy today. Uh, in, in terms of our output, we hold events like these, as well as conferences and colloquia. I'll mention this one in particular in a minute, as well as white papers and active research articles. In terms of this event, this is the third in the series, New Debates, Intentions, and Antitrust. The first was in November of 2018, where we looked at just the issue of antitrust and what are some of the new issues that are emerging. The second issue was, uh, the second uh, version was in September of 2019, dealing with big tech and what should be done with big tech. The third is what's different about platforms. So that's, that's the second thing I was asked to talk about. The third is uh, when we get to Q&A, a request has been made to wait for a microphone such that we pick up the audio. When you ask your question, just state who you are and maybe your affiliation prior to engaging in your question that's asked. Just wait for a microphone. The fourth is I'm actually the introducer of the introducers. So there's two of them. One is John Mayo. John's the Elsa Carlson McDonough Chair in Business Administration at the McDonough School of Business. Uh, John is also the Executive Director of the Center for Business and Public Policy. John is sort of a leading scholar in antitrust and innovation and, regu and, and regulation. And then finally, John has an undergraduate degree from Hendricks College in economics and PhDs from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, all the way down is Mark Whitener. Uh, Mark is, is a senior industry and innovation fellow with the center, but prior to that, he was at GE for a number of years where he was Global Executive Counsel for Competition Law and Policy at GE. He did a number of mergers and acquisitions for GE while he was there. Uh, he spent some time as Deputy Director for the Federal Trade Commission Bureau of Competition. Mark has an undergraduate degree from Washington University in St. Louis in Political Science, as well as a JD from the University of Chicago. With that, I'm finished. I'm going to leave it to Mark to take over and do some more introductions. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'll try to be brief. Um, this is the third in our series of Georgetown on the Hill programs uh, entitled New Debates and New Tensions in Antitrust. So why the focus? Why such a focus on antitrust? Obviously, we think it deserves the attention. It's a crucial policy sector. It affects a wide range of business activities. But it's also complex and often misunderstood. Our first antitrust session in 2018 highlighted the growing policy debates over antitrust, began a discussion of where antitrust policy might be headed in the future. The second session last year started to do a deeper dive on antitrust in the tech sector. This third program today focuses on an element of tech competition that has drawn attention and perhaps created some confusion in the ongoing antitrust policy debate, the role of so-called platforms. Uh, my co-moderator, John Mayo, and I are joined today by an exceptional panel of experts who will help us understand the key issues, such as what is a platform, or maybe more accurately, what types of platforms operate today in our economy? What value do they create? How might they harm competition? How does antitrust come into play? Are they creating new issues for antitrust to grapple with? Do they require new policies or new tools? Or do existing antitrust principles work? And where are we headed? How should we evaluate proposals from presidential candidates and others to change how we regulate uh, firms in general and platforms in particular? 
So our panelists today, Tasneem Chipti is an expert in industrial organization, antitrust economics, and econometrics. She's the founder and managing principal of Matrix Economics, where she works with both private parties and government agencies in antitrust litigation and merger reviews in a broad array of industries, including serving as an antitrust expert for the Department of Justice in a major lawsuit challenging restraints in the healthcare sector. Tasneem has served on the faculties of Ohio State, Brandeis, and MIT. She received her PhD in economics from MIT and her undergraduate degree from Wellesley. Glenn Warwick is adjunct professor emeritus of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, where he taught microeconomics, industrial organization, and econometrics for nearly 25 years. Glenn is also a senior consultant with the litigation consulting company Compass Lexicon. Holds his PhD in economics and then an MA in statistics from Berkeley and a BA from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Glenn has published many articles on topics in industrial organization, regulation, antitrust policy, intellectual property, and network industries. Finally, Josh Wright is University Professor of Law at George Mason University Law School, where he also holds the courtesy appointment in the Economics Department. Josh is also Executive Director of the Global Antitrust Institute. From 2013 to 2015, he served as Commissioner at the FTC. Josh received his JD from UCLA and his PhD in Economics from UCLA, and he's a leading scholar in antitrust law, economics, intellectual property, and consumer protection. With that, I will turn it over to my co-moderator, John Mayo, who will kick off the discussion. So let me first say that you've probably been to many panels uh, here and elsewhere around town, and typically you'd have only a single moderator. I think it's a, a statement that we're making about the wiliness of our panel, <laughs> that we have uh, two moderators and we've got them surrounded. And you've got them surrounded as well, so uh, there's gonna be ample opportunity for you to weigh in. I know there are a number of people in the room who are experts uh, in your own rights, and we'd love to sort of further the dialogue and discussion, so there'll be ample time for Q&A. Uh, let me get started as a moderator and just do a, a small amount of stage setting. If we, um, if we think about the title for this event, it is entitled New Debates and Tensions in antitrust, what's new about platforms? And the very fact that we are asking the question, what's new about platforms, should clue you in to the idea that maybe, just maybe, there is something different about platforms relative to typical commerce. And I think everybody in this room understands typical commerce. The, uh, many of you grabbed a bottle of water, for instance, when you came in, or something else to drink. If you were to have a bottle of water in your pocket and I had a dollar in my pocket and I were to value your water more than I value the dollar in my pocket and you were to value the dollar in my pocket more than uh, I valued it, then we might mutually exchange the water for the dollar and in that little economy, that little society, we would both mutually benefit creating a Pareto improvement our little society would, would be better off. And it scales up to typical commerce. That's how typical commerce works. So what's the deal with platforms? So first, let's just try to get a working definition of platforms on the table, and maybe that will help us as we move forward. So let me try the following. That a platform is an infrastructure that creates value by reducing transaction costs, for two or more parties, allowing them to interact either socially or commercially, where, but for the presence of transaction costs, the parties would interact uh, and mutually benefit directly. So let me say that again, because that was <laughs> maybe a mouthful, all right? So a, a platform is an infrastructure that creates value by reducing transaction costs for two or more parties allowing them to interact commercially or socially, where, but for the presence of transaction costs in general, the parties could mutually benefit by ex directly exchanging with themselves. You, now that gets us started, but it doesn't quite get us all the way there because that definition encompasses a lot of traditional commerce. So that we then get to the next distinguishing characteristic of platforms, 
which is that they are characterized by what economists refer to as indirect network effects. Indirect network effects. So let me just take a second to stage set on that. <coughs> so let me drop the word indirect for a moment and let me come back to that. Network effects are something that has been studied in the economics community since about 1970. And it distinguishes two types of goods. Let's just take again, I'm thinking of the box lunch behind you that hopefully all of you saw an apple at the bottom of your box lunch. Uh, if, you were, if you're consuming an apple, the value of you consuming the apple depends on several things. How hungry you are, whether you like fruit or not, whether you like red or green, whether you think it's a Rome or a, a, a Macintosh apple. But nothing about the value that you attribute to consuming that apple depends on whether I consume apples or anybody on this panel consumes apples. Now let's contrast that with the way with a good like telephones, like a telephone service. With telephone service, here I've got a prop. Wait, wait for it. <laughs> Everybody else has one too. Just took me a lot of report down. All right. So if I were to think about telephone service, the value of uh, to me of subscribing to a telephone service depends not only on all those sorts of characteristics that I just described earlier. But also, but also on whether you subscribe to a telephone service. That it depends on the number of people that are subscribing to the telephone service. Generally, positively so. So that at the extreme, if none of you, if nobody in, in America were subscribed to a telephone service, the value to me of subscribing to the telephone service would be zero. So it depends on the number of subscribers to a particular good or service, unlike an apple. Now that's a typical case of a network effect. Now let's add the word indirect. Let's move to, to modern day platforms or platforms in general. In platforms in general, the demand or the value to subscribing to a platform depends not only on one side of the platform, the number of people on one side of the platform, but the number of people on the other side of the platform. So the classic example would be ride sharing. If you thought about ride sharing, the value to a platform, a ride sharing platform by drivers depends on how many riders there are on the platform. The value to riders associated with, with being part of that platform depends on how many drivers there are on the other side of the platform. Hence the network effect is indirect. So with those definitions, I think it will help facilitate the conversation that we have today. It also, I think, just right away creates sort of two observations. One is that if you think about the last 20 years, at least with the onset of new online platforms, these online platforms have grown tremendously. That is to say that they have reduced, back to the definition of reduced, the transaction cost for parties to get together to exchange or interact either socially or commercially in let's not say millions, let's say billions of transactions. Billions of transactions. So transactions are occurring that would, but for the existence of these platforms, not be occurring in our society. They'd either not be occurring or they would be occurring at significantly higher cost than, than today. The consequence of that, the inevitable consequence of that is, conclusion is, that they have created massive gains in economic efficiency in the U.S. economy. That's observation number one. Observation two is that their growth and add in the observation that they are subject to network effects and these indirect network effects have created a concern because as you, I described it, network effects and indirect network effects, the value for any particular party to the platform is going to positively depend on the size of the platform. So there is a concern that people, ceteris paribus, will value large platforms more than small platforms, creating a dominant position by large platforms, monopoly power, the potential for monopolistic abuses, which brings us to antitrust, and the concern that has been raised, one of those concerns has been whether traditional antitrust law and traditional antitrust economics 
has the scope to encompass these new concerns. So that's what we're here for today. Now, with that tee up, we've asked, I've asked Glenn if he wouldn't mind doing a little bit of a deeper dive on, on platform economics and, um, and what we know and what we don't know. Glenn, let me turn it over to you. A, a lot of what I have to say here will uh, repeat what John has just said, but perhaps hopefully add a little bit more detail to it. Um, his first question was, what is a platform? Incidentally, one of the reasons we're interested in that is because if we are going to develop antitrust policies that are specific to platforms and apply them differently than we ought to do to other forms of, of, of uh, markets, um, we have to know, you know what a platform is uh, and what, is, what it's not, in which case it, it is uh, not to be so treated. Now, uh, one of the points that I'm going to try to make uh, here, I think it's pretty obvious, is, is that uh, platforms, in a sense, are not new. It's really a modern term for an intermediary, um, a market maker, a broker, a clearinghouse, uh, those bringing together uh, parties to interact and, and possibly uh, transact. Uh, in particular, it says uh, you know, that, that there's distinct groups, somebody who wants an apple, somebody who's got an apple, but it really would be a third person here in this room bringing those two parties together to, to make the transaction. The platform itself does not get involved uh, in making goods or consuming goods. It doesn't necessarily even own goods like inventories. It wouldn't hold that apple in search for another party that, that wanted it. It simply executes this, this transaction. Uh, its job more is to build the platform, bringing the different parties, the different groups of, of traders together and to facilitate uh, their, their interaction. And I'm going to have more to say, more specific about platforms against some general ideas. Um, in some sense, our, our basic idea of the, of, the, of the firm is a platform in the sense that it matches together consumers with input providers, uh, workers, energy, materials, equipment, and so forth. So is that a platform? Um, well, it, it, it really isn't the same idea. Uh, those transaction costs that John had mentioned are really uh, internalized in the firm through contracts uh, with all these parties. I left the possibility of that dashed line is that you could actually get service directly from one of the input providers. You know, you could work with a, a construction company and and pull somebody aside and say, could you come and, and, and um, renovate my bathroom on the weekend? Um, so it's, it's possible, again, the, uh, the extent of the transactions cost of doing that may, may prevent it. So the picture instead for a platform looks more like this, at least that's what I envision. Uh, rather than what we had before as a top-down, is we have this, in the case of a two-sided platform. We have um, two groups. Uh, I'll be more specific of what those groups could be, but let's, let's use uh, John's uh, ride-sharing example with riders and, and, and drivers. And the platform, which would be Uber or Lyft, brings them together. It doesn't own taxis. It doesn't own um, uh, or employ drivers. What it does is it matches the riders with the drivers on a particular route for a particular, to make a particular transaction. Now, um, as John had just mentioned, there's the benefits of being on one side of this market from having a large number on the other. Okay. When I came over here this morning, I, I opened Lyft and I opened uh, Uber. And among other things, I saw the number of cars in the vicinity of where I was. Um, the more cars, the closer they are, the, the shorter amount of time I have, have to wait. Okay. So a lot of drivers benefit any single 
consumer. You think of the left hand side as a, a, a uh, rider and the right hand side as, as drivers. And there's a lot on the other side. Um, it's, it's to the benefit of, of a rider. The flip is also true. Th that, that's the indirect network effects that John talked about. The flip is also true. If you're going to drive for Uber, you want a lot of possibilities of fares popping up. And I don't know what their screen looks like, but I assume they have little people on, on there. And, and, and they're the ones that are calling and making a request for, for a pickup. One little footnote, though. Well, anyways, the, the the idea is that they want to drive when there's a lot of people who have that app on their phone and use it, both the app and the, and the use. So the indirect network effects go in both directions. You've got to be a little bit careful. I won't get into this, but you also don't like a lot of people on your side of the platform. Right? If you are looking for a ride in rush hour and there's thousands of other people in the vicinity that are doing the, the same for a fixed number of, of drivers, it's going to be difficult. So what you have is the flip side of a, a positive network effect is congestion. Drivers also would like to be the among the very few that would be available to, to pick up. They wouldn't have any competition. So, there can be both positive and negative uh, network effects. Um, here are some, some other uh, examples. And I've listed in the first half of these are really traditional, non-digital economy examples of platforms. Uh, great examples of New York Stock Exchange, where they bring together people who own stock with people who want to buy that stock. Right? buyers and sellers. Uh, tonight, I'm sure we're going to see a, a, a shot of the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and I, I hope the news is better than it was last week. Um, in fact, they are trading on that floor. All the trading is going on is data centers in, in, in New Jersey, but it makes for, for good, uh, um, good, good film. Um, but that is a classic example of, of a platform bringing together these two groups face to face, making exchange, you know, yelling at each other and so forth. Other examples, savings banks, payment cards, uh, selling home, HMOs are, are really uh, platforms as well, bringing together uh, medical, uh, you know, healthcare providers with patients. Um, uh, shopping mall. Why is a shopping mall a platform? Is uh, that it brings in the, the retailers by signing leases, right, and then draws the shoppers into the mall to buy from those those retailers. You want to go to a mall that has a lot of stores, especially a lot of stores that you like. Right? You want to rent space in that mall because a lot of people with disposable income shop at that, that mall. So again, bringing the two sides into, in this, this case again, a physical space. The platforms that are making the headlines right now, though, are, are not physical space, brick and mortar platforms. They're digital platforms. And just talked about Ubers uh, as, as a great example, but also Airbnb, Etsy, eBay was one of the earliest. That's an auction format. Not all, all auctions are necessarily platforms, but they in particular, uh, eBay in particular, is and that it's got um, sellers and buyers being brought together with an auction format or a uh, buy it now pricing. Right? So they're, they're old and they're new, so the, the, the issues have been around. I think I've, I've already made this point here that uh, there's, there's multiple sides. We'll often talk about two sides of the market. Uh, there's the indirect network effects, uh, sometimes called cross-platform effects. And what we're going to find is the relative pricing really matters. Again, the job of the platform is to bring in the two sides, the retailers and the shoppers, the drivers and the riders. And so their pricing to those two groups are really key in making that happen. So 
let's uh, let's talk about Uber uh, a little bit more, and I'm going to get a little bit geeky here. Uh, but here's a example of a, a two-sided uh, platform. It turns out in the early days, the fare that you paid Uber, about 20% went uh, back to Uber. 80% went to the driver. That's changed over time. Um, they've taken a bigger and bigger bite. Uh, and it's the, the, there's a rather complicated formula that has to do with mileage, time, and uh, other other kinds of charges, but this is the basic idea. This uh, notion of an indirect network effect shows up, and the benefit to a rider depends on the number n of drivers. And the benefit to a driver of being on the Uber platform, besides the fare that it gets, is dependent on the number of riders that are requesting its service. Okay, so that's going to be taken into account. Now, this problem was addressed in uh, early 2000s by Jean-Charles Rocher and Jean Tirole. Jean Tirole, since that time, won the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, and Industrial Organization. And they laid out the first uh, basic model of this situation. Uh, I won't go through how they got to this point, but in terms of setting that price, uh, prices to both sides, the rider and the driver, uh, that's the PR for P, price for rider, PD for uh, driver, um, they had two rules. The first was a rule that said that the combined price would be inversely related to the elasticity of the two groups. How responsive are they to a price rise? If riders have a lot of public transportation, taxis, their own car, bicycles, you name it, they're going to be very elastic. So their E here uh, is going to be a, a large positive number. Similar, the drivers have a lot of other options in the gig economy. They uh, will also be elastic. All right, so that determines how much you can jack up that price combined. Um, but there's also rules about the structure of prices. Once you decide, I think my fee was $15.15 today, 50 cents cheaper on Lyft than Uber, really intense competition. Um, how is that split up at 15.15 between the driver and the and rider? Well, that depends, again, on their sensitivity. You, get too, you pay too much to the drivers, you, get, uh, or, uh, you pay too little to the drivers, there's too few drivers out there relative to the riders. You charge the riders too much, and there's a not enough fares to pick up for the existing number of riders. So the second rule is they conclude that um, the price structure really matters. And that's, that's a, a new aspect of, the, of platforms. If you get it wrong, um, you can see what, what happens. This is just a, a, a snapshot of uh, about half a dozen years in terms of uh, unique views on Facebook and MySpace, if you ever heard of MySpace. Um, but this is a good example of what happens when, when you get a platform wrong, those network positive feedback network effects either kick in or they peter out. And they clearly petered out for MySpace, which uh, peaked out somewhere in the, near the end, the middle of uh, 2008. Facebook uh, took off and never looked back. They're about 10 or 15 times larger today than, than, they have, than this graph uh, shows. Um, so they have reach critical mass and, 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 and have taken off, right? Um, quickly, a couple other important platforms, little configurations to, to keep in mind. Not all platforms are two-sided, some are three-sided. Uh, the, the popular three-sided ones add a third size, which is advertising. And again, this is not, you know, digital economy only. Newspapers are three-sided. There's writers, readers, and advertisers. Same thing for 
television. Over-the-air television is programmers, viewers, advertising. So the advertising platforms um, add another wrinkle of, of the advertisers. There's a great deal of interest now because in the digital economy, what's being generated and what is being paid in a lot of cases is data, consumer data being paid to the, the distribution platform that eventually goes back to, to advertisers. Um, uh, another uh, uh, aspect of this is one I had mentioned with Uber and Lyft. You can have competing platforms right side, side by side. Um, the, the wrinkle that this adds in is that as a customer, you can, uh, what's called multi-home, you can, you can be a member of two or more platforms. I've got both the Uber and the, the Lyft uh, app on my, my phone. I jog back and forth. I saw Uber was 50 cents, I'm really cheap, I guess, 50 <laughs> cents more, and so I went with, 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 with Lyft, uh, same time as to pick up. Um, and I could you do that, I could use potentially two sets of drivers at my disposal. Now, in fact, we know, because you can see the cars driving around with little symbols on it, they multi-home on their side of the market as well. They, they, they drive for both Uber and, and Lyft. Anyways, this is an important uh, competitive aspect when customers can vote with their feet by, by choosing among different platforms. All right, the last uh, little uh, configuration is one in which there is a platform and this one I'm highlighting here is the uh, uh, Amazon Marketplace for independent sellers. Um, but also Amazon has its own business, more in line with that first slide I had. It's a, a, just a traditional business that produces uh, products. I think they call them a Amazon Essentials is, is a popular line, kind of the house brand. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that raises this question of the treatment of those independent merchants on that aspect relative to the own brand, the house brand. Okay. Uh, we'll see that in a second. Just a couple more slides here. Um, and this is an important one in, in for our purposes here today, and that's that the uh, antitrust policy towards these platforms and not like what we have done for one-sided or, or non-platform markets. Um, we do things like measure market power, define the, the, the antitrust market, measure entry barriers. <coughs> things are simply different because there are platforms. Right? Um, the rule that I had about setting the structure of prices on the Uber platform between riders and drivers you could have an, Im an extreme imbalance to the point where the, the prices were actually below cost. Early examples of the people writing on this um, were look at the singles bars and uh, as a platform to bring men and women together. And an example of that extreme Im imbalance would be no cover charge for, for women. Not my example. <laughs> and but the idea is that uh, what we see is a mark down and a mark up relative to cost. A mark down relative cost being say predation, and a mark up being market power. If we only look on one side of the market, it doesn't tell the whole story because that could happen even if there's intense competition. You don't have market power in the market for singles bars but you have this structure of pricing that has no cover for, for women. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to wrap up. There's a, there's a laundry list of antitrust harms that have developed on regular non-platform markets. And uh, the question is, if we go through those, but observe them in a platform market, do things change? And I mean, this, the short answer is, is yes. They, they, they do change in part because the, the, the rules for pricing um, don't go through 
uh, like we saw before in terms of uh, relative to, to cost. Um, uh, exclusive contracting may be a way of getting one side not to multi-home, but to be on your platform. That's not necessarily a bad thing because it, because of the indirect network effects, benefits the other side of the platform. I'm not suggesting Uber should monopolize uh, the the drivers, although it would like to. Um, but it would have then more drivers um, available to to uh, those uh, those riders that have its app. Anyways. Um, uh, there's a lot of exclusionary conduct that, that uh, could occur, but the, the typical prescriptions of how to address those no longer um, apply. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it to Tasneem and, and Josh here to say more about the antitrust policy, but sort of the takeaways, there's, there's uh, platforms all over the place, uh, they're not new. Um, lead to high concentration. I think John had, had mentioned this, and competition policy really needs to be tailored um, to those particular, the economics of those particular uh, industries. Um, I'd add, and I, I think we'll find out here uh, today, that antitrust is, is uh, towards platforms is really a work in, in progress, and um, we've got a lot yet to do. Glenn, thank you very much. Uh, Tasneem, let's turn to you if we could. Um, so what's relevant, what's irrelevant, what's important, what's not important? Uh, right. uh, so, so good afternoon, everyone. Let me try to pick up where Glenn left off. And what I'd like to do is actually take a couple of steps back and talk about the anatomy of an antitrust case. Because as Glenn said, in part, the uh, platforms have been around for a long time. And uh, several times he said, but there's work to be done to understand how to deal with them. So, so let's, I think it's a good place to start. How are we currently dealing with an antitrust question when it comes along? And I think if we can understand that, we can then ask, is the analysis, how is the analysis, how should the analysis be different? Okay, so, 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 so let me start. Um, there are essentially three steps to any antitrust analysis. The first step involves assessing the competitive effects of the conduct at issue. So did the conduct interfere with the competitive process? And did the, uh, did the conduct allow the firm to raise price above the competitive level, whatever that is in that, in that marketplace? You know, so so that's, that's the first step. And this, the, this, this, these questions are typically answered in a variety of different ways. It depends on the facts and uh, the circumstances. But really, there are two branches. The first branch is sort of what we call the direct effects evidence. We look to see if the conduct allowed firm, the firm to either raise price, uh, do some reduce output, do something that affected what we would normally consider a good outcome of the competitive process. So we look for direct evidence. Now, uh, if you want to bolster the case or you have a hard time uh, quantifying the direct effects, you sometimes turn to sort of the second pronged approach which is to develop indirect evidence. So the indirect evidence is really a structural analysis to evaluate whether the firm, who is alleged to have engaged in some conduct, has the market power necessary to interfere with the competitive process. So, so that's, that's the two-pronged approach. Um, we care about market power, obviously, because if a firm doesn't have market power or sufficient market power, then the market forces should resolve whatever concern you might have had. So these are the two prongs. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about how, does, how do, we, do we do anything different if you're faced with a platform having alleged to have engaged in some conduct. Uh, the second prong of the analysis is really to assess uh, <coughs> legitimate business justification. So, you know, uh, uh, at this point, the, the platform who might have been accused of engaging in some conduct would have to justify why it needed to do what it did to achieve something positive. And if there is a legitimate business justification, then we'd engage in some balancing. We try to figure out if the pros outweigh the cons. <coughs> now the third step of the analysis, if we get that far, and what I mean by if we get that far is if there's a showing of competitive harm, and there's a showing of a legitimate business justification, then we could ask whether there was a less restrictive way 
to achieve the business objective so that we retain the positives and jettison the negatives. Okay, so that's, that's the basic anatomy. And so how are platforms different? Now, I will say that the same three rubric pieces of, of analyses apply to platforms. We've got to march through those steps. But the analysis has to be tailored to account for the types of differences that Glenn and John have just talked about. And so as I sit back and I think about what's really different or hard, harder, perhaps, about platforms, I can point to three things. Maybe there probably is a much bigger laundry list, but I, I will describe three things. And these are the, actually the three things that I will suggest that uh, the courts grappled with in uh, United States versus American Express, or what came to be known as Ohio versus American Express. Um, and so, so here are the three things, at least according to my list, and in, in, in perhaps no particular order of challenge in terms of managing the work. Um, the first is that when you are studying pricing behavior for a platform, you have to recognize the linkages across the different sides of the platform. Uh, and if you don't, you're going to get sort of your notion of what's a competitive outcome wrong. Okay, so, so how, how do you do this? How do you recognize these linkages? Well, consider the example that we've heard about already um, from, from Glenn and John. Consider the ride-sharing example. So this is a plat plat platform with drivers on the one side and riders on the other. And so how do you think about the competitive outcome in this marketplace? Well, first, if you th I think it helps to think about the one-sided market. Imagine it was just the platform dealing with the driver. Uh, and you ask the question, uh, would the platform want to raise price? What's the optimal price for the platform? Well, the platform's going to do what any firm does. It's going to balance the gain and the loss from the thought of raising the price. Uh, on the loss side, the, uh, the platform will, when thinking about should I raise price, they will, they will face the loss on margins for volume it no longer has because drivers walk away from the platform. Right? So raising price to drivers is raising the, the, the take, the, the commission that the platform takes from the driver. On the gain side, the platform will make more money on all the rides that it continues to, you know, to generate revenues on. So that's the single-sided, the one-sided consideration. So how's the platform any different? Well, in the, for the two-sided market, you have to recognize that fewer drivers will mean, fewer, will mean less passenger demand because of the longer wait times. And so there's an additional loss to factor in, in the profit map, right? And so what will happen is that as a result of this additional loss, or what we call this indirect network effect, there will be the platform will actually choose a lower price because there's more loss from the price increase than it would have in the one-sided market. This is often why we have, at least for one side of a platform, a price could actually be zero or negative, <coughs> which kind of seems odd at first blush, but it's a very rational outcome of a competitive process. So when you're evaluating competitive harm, you have to be careful not to be too alarmed by seeing low prices, which we might be alarmed with in a more traditional setting. Okay, the second distinction really involves price structure, and Glenn spent some time talking about that. And here, the question is really, how do we think about prices? Do we think about the price on the one side, the price on the other side, or some kind of a uh, price that is the cost of the network itself, right? Uh, in United States versus American Express, this was a big deal. It all came down to how do we think about prices? Um, you know, another way in which platforms are different and perhaps sort of, you know, central to this whole notion of creating a scale on both sides. You want sufficient drivers, you want sufficient riders. So, so platforms are forced to build sufficient scale in order to create the value of the platform. And so you can think about in a traditional setting where you might have, you might become alarmed with firms that are of very large size, well platforms may not succeed unless they achieve a sufficient scale. So how do we think about scale? Well it might be different in a platform setting versus a traditional setting. And further, the loss of participation on one side will drive a negative feedback loop, which in United States versus American Express, American Express said would create what they call the death spiral if they couldn't do what they were setting out to do on the merchant side because of the linkages on the cardholder side. 
Okay, so, so let me just step back and say what did happen in United States versus American Express, or actually I'll describe Ohio versus American Express, what the Supreme Court uh, said and how they processed sort of the fact pattern in, in this case. So this was a five to four decision for Amex. Uh, the, the issue was that American Express imposed certain vertical restraints on merchants who were on one side of the platform, merchants accept credit cards for payment from their customers. On the other side of the platform are the cardholders, who in American Express's business model get rich rewards because American Express is trying to entice high paying customers to use their, their, their network. So, uh, so the, the, the case was all about the vertical restraints that the network imposed on merchants. Um, well, so how did the majority think about the fact pattern here? Um, well, they recognize that credit card networks are platforms, and in fact, they specifically describe credit card networks as transaction platforms. So they said this is a very special kind of platform because in this platform, it's not possible to make a sale to one side without simultaneously making a sale on the other side. The transaction platform is actually different from many of the examples that Glenn had on his list of, of platforms. So I think that sort of was their starting point, that this, they, 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 the, the court described this as being somehow special because this is a transaction platform. And they also thought that the government's market definition, which focused on the merchant side, was inappropriate because they said, wait, we've got to recognize the cardholder side and the special role that a platform uh, plays. Um, they didn't think that price increases just on the merchant side would be enough to prove competitive harm. They, in fact, um, recognized that the price increases on the merchant side allowed American Express to be more generous on the reward side, and they struggled with how you draw inference of harm to competition from just one side of the market. Now, in their analysis, and I would say in, in, in a lot of the analysis, there was a um, circumventing of the discussion of price structure, which I think you have to have, because you can't, you know, th there's no other price. There are two prices. There's the price the credit card company charges the merchants, the merchant fee, and there's the price, if you will, that the credit card company charges the cardholder. It's some combination uh, heavily reflected for American Express by their reward, so it might even be a negative price. <coughs> there's no third price. There's no price of the network. And so how do you combine these two prices? Where does one look? And I think there's still some guidance to be sort of given on this. Uh, but in any case, this was a big thing the court struggled with. And in the end, uh, they said that they wanted to see evidence of an increase in the overall cost of the platform, which the states and the federal government had not given. Um, and ultimately, the court <coughs> accepted American Express's business justification that it needed to charge merchants more in order to reward cardholders to increase spending, and that without this, it, they could not distinguish themselves from Visa and MasterCard. Now, the minor minority thought that, in fact, the majority's emphasis on market definition was inappropriate. That Remember I described to you the two-pronged approach. You can either go to direct effects or you can do a structural analysis, and that you didn't need to do the structural analysis because you had evidence of direct effects. Uh, they thought it was impossible to conclude. Um, I'm sorry, they, they, unlike the majority, the, the minority thought it was possible to conclude harm on the merchant side because of this concern about price structure. And then finally, the court said that the minority said that one should not combine customers for separate non substitutable goods to see if an overall restraint had a negative effect, meaning that you can't just add up the dollars. You can't say, okay, merchants, maybe were overcharged by $100, but consumers benefited by $110. And so net, net, this is quite good because in fact, merchants and cardholders are different consumers of the platform and you can't do that kind of just simple adding up. Great. Tasneem, thank you. Um, let's go to Josh, and then we will have a few questions and answers from the panel here, and then I'll open it up for all of you. Um, Josh, you've been an enforcer, you're a lawyer and an economist. Can you help, help us pull all this together? I will try. Um, so, so let me talk about a couple of things. Kind of, uh, we're, we're loaded up with very good economists, so I think I'll talk mostly about uh, 
where this sort of leaves antitrust law and policy and enforcement, um, kind of taking the economics for, for, for granted. There are a couple of things that I think are relatively agreed upon in the state of play in, in, in economics. Sort of one is that this is big high stakes stuff. Platforms generate, generate huge amounts of, of consumer surplus. Pretty hard to measure, but if you do the thought experiment, like I, I don't know what Facebook is or how to use it, but you, you do. And so you know, what would I have to pay you to give it up um, or choose Twitter or your email or, or, or whatever? Um, there's an economist uh, who just left MIT to Stanford who's sort of done large scale uh, experiments of this nature, you know, billions and billions of dollars of surplus, right? So when we're talking about tinkering with the rules of platforms, whether through antitrust or something else, because we want to make life a little bit better on one side, we're really worried about what happens on the other side, and we're not talking about small, sort of small amounts. Right? Um, two, I think there's an agreement that the, um, the economic fundamentals, you know, demand curves are still sloping downward. Uh, we're still wanting to sort of use economic analysis to sort of predict uh, whether conduct by platforms is sort of making the, the world better off or worse. Um, but that we need to take special care and attention to some of these features that are uh, unique to platforms. Um, three, we have in antitrust all sorts of, I mean, there are all sorts of bad things that firms can do that leave some group of consumers worse off that aren't antitrust issues. Uh, you know, I go to Starbucks every day because I have a caffeine addiction, and they still, you know, I drink all of my coffee black, and they insist on giving all of the milk and cream away for free to you milk and cream users. <laughs> and I'm subsidizing you and I've been upset about it for a really long time. I just <laughs> felt like now is the time to share it. Uh, but, but, but things could be different. I could get my coffee cheaper, but we sort of let them decide how to make those, those, those business decisions. Um, heterogeneous effects everywhere, you know, black coffee drinkers versus those that take, uh, you know, uh, cream or sugar in, in, in their coffee. Um, and antitrust has sort of dealt with that. We have all sorts of conduct that affects different groups differently. Platforms, we get sort of hit in the head a little bit more uh, plainly with that. They're on different sides of the platform, and that sounds like a much more binary distinction. Uh, but we've sort of done this before in other places. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but we have the idea that firms without monopoly power, so, so we, dating sites have been, been mentioned. You imagine a, a specialized dating, you know, men and women over 6'5", right? It's a special dating, you know, farmers only. I saw a commercial on TV, uh, just farmers for a dating uh, site. So uh, no monopoly power. We're not talking about Facebook. They could set some rules that harm someone on some side of the platform, right? They could do the thing we're talking about in the Google and Amazon and whatever cases. Um, and so really where the rubber hits the road for antitrust policy, now we would all probably agree if I pick my, my dating website example correctly, that's not an antitrust problem, mm -hmm. right? A firm without monopoly power is causing the same sorts of effects, it's the thing we're here to talk about for antitrust, and that's really the, the, the challenge for antitrust and competition policy is when are we worried about it? Just when it's really big firms? What do we mean by that? Are we going to define markets? Is it, is it market share? Is it sort of size of volume? But that's kind of the, the sort of big sets of challenges uh, for antitrust policy. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, also about, about Amex because in terms of doctrine, you know, real uh, law sort of governing conduct by platforms, right? one, it's a Supreme Court case. Two, it's really the only one we have that talks about platforms as platforms, right? Um, all of the normal antitrust law sort of principles apply, right? So uh, the way that we think about what a plaintiff has to show uh, in a monopolization case, you know, the type of case that would be brought against uh, Google or Amazon or whomever in this context, um, a name sort of set up the, the different steps. But, what Amex is about, and I think really where the rubber hits the road on decisions to make in terms of whether we are doing things correctly or not, or whether we want to change anything, is what is the plaintiff's burden of proof? So step one, how we decide step one. Step one normally is the plaintiff has to muster up some evidence of anti-competitive effect. The big issue here is it's unclear what that means. I know what that means in the single-sided market context. We. Economics 101, what's a monopolist do? It raises the price, it reduces the market output. Right? We can come up with more complicated stories and that's fine, but sort of the basic story is the monopolist raises price and reduces output. At the end of the, the day in Amex, the Supreme Court said, um, 
goodness, the firm had 26% of the market in the market that they defined, and maybe that's not monopoly power, uh, and sort of yawned, and then said the evidence is that output either went up and stayed the same. There are special things to talk about in Amex. How the plaintiff lost is not one of them. Um, they lost the way that other plaintiffs lose. If you come into court and output went up, you lose. That's, that's the same in one-sided cases. It's the same in cases that don't make the case book because they're totally uninteresting. Uh, there, are, there are interesting things about Amex. Plaintiff losing with the evidence they had isn't one. Um, and so in some sense, I read Amex and, uh, and the way that, to be, to be fair, the way that Amex gets criticized is uh, the point I'm making in its defense is, is sort of used as the criticism. We're doing regular antitrust, but platforms are different. So maybe we should think about them, them differently because we've got effects, just the merchant effects, just the cardholder effects, and the, and the court comes together and says, well, maybe if output went down, you could win on, on, on what Tasneem was describing as direct effects. So you don't have that. Can you win just by showing the merchants were made worse off? The court says no, because it's a platform. And we know there are benefits over here, and we're going to say that the plaintiff's got to sort of bear the burden of showing that on net. If you've got these two groups, one way a plaintiff can win is by showing that on net these things are overall harmful. Another way is it could have come directly and said with out, output on this transaction platform. The transaction platform has the benefit that we can actually measure output. Right, and some of these more complicated structures where I've got advertisers and I'm doing apples and oranges, and it's, 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 it's harder. Um, conceptually, that's what you'd want to do. It's just sort of as a matter of proven evidence, it's much more difficult. But that really is where the rubber hits the road, is what are we going to require of plaintiffs? And Amex puts together a pretty plain view of that. My own view, and it's something I've, I've written in academic work, is that, Amazon, uh, is that Amex says we're going to require plaintiffs and platform cases to do what plaintiffs and other cases have to do. They have to show that this was a harm consistent with the exercise of monopoly power. It can't be the dating app story. Uh, it can't be just harm to merchants that a firm without monopoly power couldn't do. Lots of different ways to do it. Plaintiff has to pick one of those ways and succeed. They didn't in that case, fine. Um, and debates about that case in particular are, are fun and interesting. But I think as a policy matter, really what's important is a discussion over what the plaintiff has to prove. If what we are going to say, sort of do the thought experiment the other direction. Amex comes out the other way. Right? And so the Supreme Court says, or an agency says, or there's legislation that says, the plaintiff satisfies its burden of proof. Step one is completed merely by the showing that anybody on any side of the platform is harmed. Okay? Every platform satisfies that definition. The, my, my, my farmers only, I don't know, 6-5 farmers, whatever. Every rule change they do is going to harm on one side. That's the nature of platforms. It's how it works. It's why they are platforms. Uh, and so if we say that, uh, that that is enough to provide, to show anti-competitive effect, we wake up in the morning on all of these cases in step two. Right? So platform comes to court, it's lost on step one, and it must come to the court or agency to defend each of its business decisions. You might think of that as a bug. You might think of that as a feature. I tend to be on the bug side of that, right? Uh, but I think that is the that is the debate. And we can tinker with other things. We can say only for platforms with monopoly power. And now we're sort of, well, let's define a market. And you know, is Amazon competing against Facebook or Google or whomever in the space, right? So we get into fights over uh, market definition, which you know, people have done for a really long, long time. There are other proposals around, and I think we'll do some of this in the discussion. The sort of the Amex route of this, which is, I think, sort of the traditional antitrust route. Um, there is um, presumptions, right? There are presumptions. So some of the legal, some of the arguments that have been proposed uh, and floated around antitrust policy circles, and I think in some cases made by presidential candidates, have said, let's just say if you're a platform above X share, you win step one. Hmm. I just, I don't know. Put Facebook on a complaint and you win step one. Um, that's one way to do it. It ignores all the analysis. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> right? You just force defendants to come to court. And, 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 and maybe if we had a big bunch of evidence that there's all sorts of conduct out there that we knew was bad, and so the traditional approach was failing, I think, I think that would be a more fun discussion to have. We don't. 
Um, we don't have a lot of evidence in either direction. We have a handful of cases. Uh, Google Shopping brought by, you know, Brazil and the United States analyze the conduct and say no economic harm, in fact benefits, and they close investigations. Europe fines $5 billion, but Europe does that to everyone, and so it's hard to make a lot of the underlying merits of the decision in terms of the economics, right, if you want to get it right. The, but you could have presumptions, either of legality or illegality, right? But right now, I think the, the sort of a more popular political flavor in terms of presumptions that would impact antitrust law are we define some scope of a platform and size requirement, billion dollars, 70% of something, whatever, and we say step one is done. Defend it, come and, and justify your conduct, and we sort of get courts and agencies involved in the managing of the rules and structure of platforms. The last version that I'll stop that's sort of on the policy menu uh, is we could sort of forget presumptions and go into court. We could just ban stuff outright. Um, ban platforms from making rule changes. We could break up platforms and make them smaller. Uh, that's at least in one of the proposals. Um, that's sort of the presumptions on steroids. Um, I think those are bad ideas for, for reasons that repeat the reason I think the presumptions are bad ideas. Um, but I think that those are all ways of thinking about dealing with that step one problem and how much you think, what you think the plaintiff's burden should be ought to be reflective of what the evidence is. There's a bunch of evidence that there's harm out there. Maybe you think there's a, a step one problem. It needs to be calibrated and your answer to the question is antitrust law doing its job is no work could do better. Uh, if you think, as I do, that uh, that evidence isn't out there and you're really worried about tinkering with step one because there's lots of consumer surplus benefits from platforms and I don't want to mess with them, and then you come out in a different place and, and you like, like Amex more than, than other people. But I think that's really the, the scope of the debate. Great, Josh, thank you. John, you want to lead us off with a well, question? I, no, well, I, I think in the interest of time and making sure that we get questions in, one thing, we're here on Capitol Hill. Uh, you are folks that focus on policy. We've talked so far a lot, a lot about the underlying economics and, and law. Mark, if you could maybe just give us a sort of up-to-date taxonomy of where we are on a policy front, and then I think it leads naturally to a set of questions by folks here in the audience. Sure, okay. Look, you all know some of this better than I do, but as I think about policy proposals and antitrust, I've sort of organized them in my own mind in, in, three, in three groups. The first one I'll call the outcomes uh, approach to, to changing or reforming antitrust policy. Obviously, one, one option is to leave it the way it is. Um, and Josh and others might argue without evidence that we need to change based on examples of the study of prior uh, unchallenged conduct or deals, maybe that's where things should sit. If you want to change things, one way to do it is simply by applying current law in a more, let's call it, aggressive way. I'll call this the outcomes approach because it essentially takes current law, current policy, current agency guidelines on mergers, on conduct, and says, okay, I have some decisions in the past that I think were wrong, and I think the analysis should, should have been more exacting, or the, the application of the law should have been more, uh, more pro-enforcement. That discussion and those ideas have been around forever, and they will continue to be discussed. I'll call the second category the sort of policy shift, which would be, and I would include in, in this category a number of legislative proposals that have come out of uh, that Senator Kochar and others have, have made, which would work within the existing framework of antitrust, the basic approach to economic analysis, the basic focus on consumer welfare, um, but would say, okay, within that we're going to change some things. We're going to change some uh, burdens of proof, as, as um, Josh talked about. We're going to uh, create stronger presumptions for things like market shares. Uh, we might take a more exacting approach to conduct by large firms, moving somewhat more toward a European model, but without fundamentally changing the underlying economic assumptions. And the third approach I'll call the paradigm shift. And this has various incarnations. And so one would be uh, to work with an existing antitrust law, but go back to what some people argue are the sort of Brandeisian uh, origins. If you can find you can find discussions when the Sherman Act was passed over 100 years ago to concerns about th such things as political consequences of large firms, uh, social inequality, and the like. And so that would be to say, let's just rethink this whole contemporary economics, consumer welfare focused approach and apply a different, fundamentally different uh, paradigm. 
looking at business behavior in a much more, I would say, typically skeptical way, and addressing other concerns beyond economic impact. Along with paradigm, the paradigm shift would be some of the more sweeping legislative proposals. And here, Senator Warren has really staked out this ground by saying, you know, all of the all of the above more aggressive enforcement, but also let's legislate some specific changes, and particularly with respect to the topic today of platforms. And so her her most notable proposal in, in, in some would be, number one, to break up certain platforms, to disaggregate the platform itself from the other services and products that the, the firm sells on its own platform. Um, and secondly, to regulate the remaining platform essentially as a utility. I mean, she quite uh, clearly steps up to this and says, let's, let's disaggregate and let's regulate the remaining platform in the same manner we regulate utilities so that they are uh, operating in a way that whoever is doing the regulating believes is a fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory approach. Okay, so with that backdrop, I would ask the panelists, and we haven't pre-cooked this, so anybody who wants to weigh in on your thoughts on these categories, on which, if any, makes sense, the pros and cons, have at it. I, I would... Uh have a comment about I think all of those categories and, and that is uh, just a, um, a a suggestion that there's, there's a number of different issues that I don't think any of us have talked about in terms of data and consumer data and, and privacy and security and, and so forth I have a feeling that those problems in fact sort of cross the boundary over into antitrust and that it's important to carve out that portion, which is really an antitrust issue, from all these other consumer wealth, not uh, consumer protection issues. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know the specifics of Warren's uh, proposals, but I have a feeling that you know, some of the breakup ideas uh, may be motivated by non-competition policy. So I, I, I think I'll speak as an economist, not as a lawmaker, but I, I have a very hard time uh, simply uh, adopting approach three, which was this break up, this paradigm shift, break up the large firms, because, you know, a fundamental tenet of U.S. competition policy and our sort of fabric of who, he, who we've been is that if you become big because you do something really good and create value, we shouldn't just chop you up. Uh, you know, you have to actually use your size in a way that willfully and somehow uh, illegally and, un, uh, and in a very uh, adverse way to competition either maintains or extends that power. So I'm all for, you know, go after the conduct when it happens, but really, uh, are we really going to start breaking up firms who, who created value for consumers in the society? Uh, I will, um I guess go go, one, we'll co co-sign testing and go one further. I think. Um, I think the way that the the sort of taxonomy of choices was set up, the sort of the, the current approach. There's the European style approach where people say that they're doing consumer welfare but sue everybody that's big, and and, def and defendants never win zero percent of the time, zero um, percent of the time. And then there's a third approach where we take the U.S. system and make it sort of European on steroids. I think the third one is, is not the, the Europe's approach, I think, just is a pretty good explanation for why there are no large tech platforms in Europe and they're all here. Um, and and for, uh, there's other reasons why it's bad, but I think it's obviously bad uh, for, for that reason. Um, it's hard to imagine a, a, a legal system that is calibrated on the cost and benefits of conduct where it has never found that the benefits outweigh the cost in the history of its operation. Um, it tells you something's wrong with the scale, right, more than it tells you something about the conduct. Uh, and so I, I very much worry about, this is why I worry about injecting presumptions and the like into the U.S. system. The U.S. system has flaws. It's, it's adopted this sort of case by case. You should hear that as really expensive um, approach to, to evaluating antitrust problems. Uh, it is expensive. Uh, it is difficult. Um, it takes a lot of economic evidence 
generalist judges get that stuff wrong sometimes, and so we sort of live with good and bad decisions where we all have panels and say, I like this one, I don't like this one. Um, but in terms of the direction that the system is shooting, like does it get stuff right on average? I think the answer is, is uh, we, compared to what? Compared to Europe, compared to the other systems, it does, does a really good job. Um, it does it expensively, and, and you know we need to sort of figure out whether um, whether we think that is that is worth it. But it has, I think, great benefit in that plaintiffs can go to court here and win monopolization cases. It happens all over the time, and sometimes this debate around tech firms takes a, a weird posture that assumes without evidence that plaintiffs don't win monopolization cases. They win them all the time. Governments go and they bring monopolization cases uh, and other antitrust cases, and so do private plaintiffs, and they win. Um, so do defendants. That seems like right, right? That both sides could win a close case. Um, and I think the US system does that now. Um, there are problems with it. I'm a law professor. I make my living entirely on complaining about problems with, with uh, the system or individual cases or whatever. But uh, if we're talking about policy, the, the general direction of which the policy is issued, I mean, compared to the other systems, uh, the other approaches uh, that Mark laid out, I think it's um, the evidence that I've seen suggests the US system uh, and outcomes are performing much better. Uh, plug for more evidence. I mean, one of the things that the FTC has done as of late, and this started um, right at the end of when my, my, my term ended as, as commissioner, um, but they have, the FTC has a unique authority to do studies, right? They can do subpoenas, collect data, and do valuable studies. There are big open questions here. I mean, these are, um, when I say there's not evidence to substantiate a change, I, I don't want you to hear there's overwhelming evidence that no change is a good idea. It re I really mean, this does, there's not a lot of evidence. Um, in the world would benefit from more, and you've got public agencies with taxpayer dollars, and probably a good expenditure of that money for a problem this big is to spend them on finding tax. Great, thank you. John, should we open it up? Well, I think we should open it up. If uh, Let me remind you, uh, if you'll just raise your hand, a microphone will come around to you, and if you could identify yourself, your organization, ask the question in the microphone for posterity's sake. And while that's happening, let me just take the moderator's liberty of just wedging in what I hope will be a quick question. And it sort of is motivated by Tasneem, you and Josh. We talked about Amex, and there's an interesting difference between the majority and the minority. I reread the case recently, and one of the things that dawned on me is what is not there. And what seems not to be there is either the majority or minority indicating that the antitrust statutes or the antitrust enforcement practices that are in place are beyond the reach of, uh, at least with respect to tech, are beyond the reach of antitrust as it, as it exists now. So, so I guess quickly, if you could opine is whether you support the dissent or the majority is is Amex at some level an indication that the that the system as you indicated, Josh, is working and it's unfolding. Yeah. So it's that's an interesting question. So the majority actually was looking for the classic evidence. They were looking for evidence of effects, and th th their 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 big point was they didn't weren't convinced why it just effects on the merchant side. So in many ways they were doing something very classical. They were looking for effects. Um, the minority actually also thought that traditional antitrust works and could work, and why isn't it just being applied here? I think that I think that both sides of that case thought the system works. We have the framework and the infrastructure and the and the knowledge. I think there was just an, a heated adversarial debate, which you know sometimes in very difficult cases is a razor edge, and I think that's why you saw a flip flop of the district court decision. Josh. I mean, yes, it was the answer to your, your, your question. I, I mean, I think Amex, um, and it's not alone, I think uh, stand for the proposition that current doctrine can handle uh, problems that arise. And two-sidedness um, or multi-sidedness means you have to make a decision about how to count up effects and where to allocate burdens. That's, that's the thing antitrust does all the time, high-tech, low-tech, uh, medium-tech. Oftentimes, uh, 
among economists, you could go pull up Jean Tirole's Nobel speech and he says, so here's the one thing we all know about platforms. You gotta count up the effects on all sides and you'll get every economist to say, yeah, that's right. And it sometimes takes a while for figuring out how to put that in a legal system with different burdens and, and whatnot. I think that's part of the, Amex I think is part of the growing pains, but, but on the simple proposition that we have plaintiffs show anti-competitive effects and to show something's anti-competitive, you gotta count up all the sides. You know, I, I think the 5-4 is growing pains, but I think it's a pretty simple proposition of economics that's not been well translated into law and policy yet. But I would predict it's, it's easier to do 10 years from now. Okay, questions? Please jump in. Hello, I'm Dana Shearer. I'm from Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. Um, like you, we're also nonpartisan, so... <laughs> Um, I have a question about vertically integrated platforms. Could you comment on cases where, say, Amazon is selling its own products on its platform, and then there's sort of like a search cost for consumers to like go beyond maybe the, the first page, or the, or the same thing with Apple, like charging a 30% commission on um, non-Apple services or apps, but yet having its own um, music service without the 30% without the commission? Look, so, so there are a bunch of these um, these around, and some of them, are, the Google Shopping case I mentioned was, a, was one of these, right? Google integrated into shopping, and they did you know, maps, and, and the, the FTC's investigation that they, that they closed was on precisely those kinds of allegations, and now you have more of them with, uh, with Amazon or Apple or, or, or what have you. And I don't, I don't want to um, go too deeply into any of the specifics of any of the one, but I think as a general matter, one of the important things about doing antitrust with platforms is sometimes the platformness matters to the allegation and sometimes it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. So if the, if the theory is Amazon entered uh, entered a market for, um, I don't know what they're selling on Amazon Basics now, where they're sort of batteries, on, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> batteries and you know t-shirts and socks or whatever, right? Most of the time the theory of harm in that case has nothing to do with platformness, right? The theory of harm is, um, Amazon came in and it sold some stocks really cheap, and so it's predation. Well, we have a rule for predation, mm -hmm. and they price below cost or not, and their two-sidedness doesn't have, at least in that style of allegation, doesn't have a lot to do with it. Now, terms to get merchants on the platform or not is a two-sidedness case, mm -hmm. right? Um, but most of the complaints in that example are, at least that I've seen, and you may have other ones in mind, but. Um, don't have a lot to do with two sides. But I think that's one of the things to grapple with is, and with the reason it makes me nervous to talk about platform specific antitrust as, a, as opposed to the general principles being applied, but carefully, uh, to take into account some of the, the economic differences, um, is when antitrust makes sector specific or business model specific rules, it does a really bad job. I mean, we declared basically everything franchises did illegal in the 70s because they were scary because they were franchises. Uh, when intellectual property became a big deal, the antitrust response, our patents are bad, and basically anything you do with a patent is illegal. Um, we've done the same with vertical integration in antitrust policy, whether we're going back 60, 70 years. Uh, we did the same with tying arrangements. We've done, there's a long history in antitrust sort of observing business models that look new or different, They're shooting first, and then 70 years later saying, Ooh, so our bad. <laughs> sometimes this is good and sometimes it's bad and maybe a system that differentiates the two and gets the bad stuff um, while letting the good stuff go is, is, is better. I would like to think, so that the, the idea of platform specific rules or even the FTC has said they want to put out platform enforcement guidance. That scares me. Um, if I were representing those firms, I'd probably want the guidance just so you could tell me what the agency is going to do. Um, but as a matter of policy, it scares me a little bit because other than, I mean, other than a dramatic reading of Amex, I don't know what the guidelines could say. There's nothing else to say. Um, and, I, and it scares me to have agencies set up um, platform specific rules. And then, by the way, there have been lots of cases before sort of the, 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 the big tech platform cases that have come out that involve a platform being accused of engaging in some kind of conduct that perhaps raises its rival's cost, which is kind of what you're describing. Mm -hmm. And it does get treated, it has been handled for, for, you know, for, for decades. Many of the examples Glenn gave were in businesses that have been around forever. 
grocery store is selling grocery their, store, their yeah, house yeah. brand alongside the, the national brands. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is William Geick. I'm from the National Academies of Sciences. Um, I just had a general question, and I have a bunch of other questions if no one else has questions. But, um, uh, I was kind of curious in terms of, um, in the eye of, let's say, anti, well, since we're here for antitrust, uh, what's sort of the difference in metrics in analyzing, let's say, a platform, something relatively simple like Uber, compared to something uh, more along the lines of an ecosystem, such as Google, or a platform of platforms? Are there any differences in how um, one would look at antitrust but like through the lens of that, like for a platform of platforms versus a singular platform? It's a good question. I think this, this is, I would think that there would be more ways to measure presence in platforms of platforms versus a, a single platform like Uber. I think though that the guidance is not quite there in the practitioner world or in the courts. This is the same kind of problem I was describing with Ohio versus American Express. How do we measure price? If you're trying to get the price of a network, that price doesn't actually exist. Like, there's no convenient price to look at. How do you measure it? You know the price to merchants, you know the price to cardholders, but what's the price of the network? And so I think that, that some of the work has to be done exactly in this area, is how do we convert our traditional measures to sort of better fit the business models of these types of platforms? One of the things that Amex does say I mean, in the world of transactional platforms, you do have one really nice benefit is that, I mean, that price comparison across sides is really thorny. Um, but in transactional platforms, I have output. There's one unit of output that sort of intermediates both sides. And the court, I think, rightly said, I, I can't, don't know how to do this with, the, with two different prices, but the number of rides went up, right? And it's really hard to tell a monopoly power story without going up. It, that, that, is a case that plaintiffs lose all the time, and, and they lost there. The tricky problem is outside of transactional platforms, we've got that price and, and that different prices problem to, to deal with, and that is for all the reasons that Tasneem stated, uh, I think will be quite difficult and something that Amex uh, did not touch and you know ran from in the decision as fast as it could. And I I, I would have too. Um, I think the other another sort of partial answer to your question is. The data and metrics really depend not just on the type of platform, um, but the conduct that is the subject of the suit, right? If I've got an agreement between platforms to collude, I, you know, I got per se rules, I don't need metrics, right? Uh, but it really depends on whether it's Amazon selling cheap socks or whether it's restriction on advertisers. I wanna be measuring different different things. And so, the, just like other antitrust cases, the, the allegation of what conduct is unlawful, I think, um, tells you what the theory of harm is, which has testable implications, and tells you where you need to go. Some places like that in antitrust are black holes right now, where we don't, we don't have good answers to the non-traditional, the sort of non-transactional platform questions. But I think um, for some of these, we do. OK, we have uh, just time check. We have three minutes. So, so let's quickly hit a couple of questions and then call it a wrap. Thanks. Uh, Rob Calderon, the US based investment firm. Could you speak a little bit about um, at the local level, uh, strategies on states, but then also on the international level, there's been a lot of talk about EU, particularly some of these uh, large um, uh, fang tech companies. <coughs> I can do the international part of that. Um, so I spend a lot of time with my center sort of running around to those, there's 130 antitrust agencies around the world, 134 uh, around the world. Um, and probably 30 or 40 that if the agency comes to bite you, you, you know, you really feel it for a while. Um, and so convergence and divergence across agencies on that stuff matters a lot more than it used to. Um, where you maybe had two or three agencies and they most, mostly agreed. I think that the gap between Europe and the U.S., um, is broadening, but I want to be careful about that, right? If you read what antitrust enforcers at the DOJ and FTC say versus read Amex, so when you talk about the difference between the US and the EU, you 
you got to be clear about whether you're talking about the Supreme Court or you're talking about speeches commissioners give. And I like to give speeches when I was a commissioner, but they didn't have the force of law. Uh, I wasn't a Supreme Court justice. Um, I, I pretended some days. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think the gap between where U.S. law is and where EU policy and law is is, is bigger than it's ever been. Uh, and I think the implications of that are as countries around the world are struggling. You know, U.S. is going to put out a platform guidance document. Guarantee you 12 other countries do in the next two years. Uh, and they're either going to copy the EU approach or the U.S. approach. Um, and that competition is a really big deal. And I think right now uh, the traditional U.S. approach, the one embodied in traditional U.S. antitrust law, is not the one that's spreading around the globe. Uh, and I don't think that that's going to change. Okay, we have time for one final question. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoever has or her hand up first. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll be glad to stay and, and answer questions offline as well. Hi, my name is Yamel Farkis. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown University. And I wanted to ask if, like, moving forward, do you see um, more of like an antitrust laws developing at a state level, like the California Consumer Privacy um, Data Act? Or uh, regardless of the guidelines you just mentioned, how do you see things on the next year? Glenn, you're from California. You're the natural <laughs> person to answer this. Well, I, I think uh, not only California, but states have been feeling their oats uh, lately, and most recently in uh, T-Mobile's uh, Sprint merger. Uh, I don't see any reason why that, that activism isn't, isn't going to uh, continue and accelerate. Um, I'm not an antitrust uh, Law scholars, so I couldn't tell you whether how that's going to whether that's going to be consistent with federal policy, but I, I imagine there's going to be more suits. I would still uh, circumscribe the data protection part of it um, from the the antitrust and um, as a, as a separate issue and one that shouldn't be addressed with antitrust. What California is going to do is anybody's guess. <laughs> Always true. Um, my quick and dirty answer on where we're going is, you know, ask me in the second week of November. Uh, <laughs> and then the second part on the states specifically, look, California, Texas, and New York are always going to sue people uh, that the feds don't sue. It's sort of a long-standing thing, and at the at the FTC in particular, you know, you have a lot of times when um, investigations are done jointly and the states don't like the outcome where the FTC wants to settle or the DOJ wants to settle or close and the states have ridden along the whole time getting free discovery and using the <laughs> FTC staff and they say well we're going to sue uh, and they get a headline and then they settle and I mean that's what happened in t Mobile Sprint uh, with some litigation in between um, the Fed enforcers are not particularly happy with the state activism but I think the politics on this are, are, are sort of quickly moving it's not just it used to be ten years ago it was um, you know, blue states suing and red states never did. The tech investigations right now are a Texas story, right? Um, it's, you, you know, that part of the politics that's running the state action, it's, you know, it's Josh Hawley in Missouri and it's, and, it, and it's Texas that are running a lot of that action in the tech cases, tech cases and it's blue states protecting a home state merger. Uh, so the state activism, I think, has changed in terms of its composition. It's changed a lot in the last couple of years. So too much of a move, moving target uh, to predict. And some of these guys, um, I guess Holly proved it was a political winner, but we'll see what happens in, in Texas. But I, so I think the equilibrium on that is yet to be seen. As a pure inside antitrust matter, um, the feds and the antitrust community as a whole are really skeptical of state uh, activism in the area. But you know, skepticism of the ABA antitrust section and five bucks gets a cup of coffee. It's not gonna, not gonna <laughs> And with that, I think our time is up. I'd like to thank our panelists and thank all of you for coming.